Welcome to the Startup Club podcast, where we share the journeys of invention, failure, resilience, and triumph of some of South Africa's top startup founders and investors. I'm Matthew Marsden, founder of Startup Club ZA, and on the show today, Buddy Sudhakaran, co-founder and chief product officer of Valor, the South African crypto exchange bent on bridging the gap between traditional financial systems and the fast-growing world of cryptocurrencies. Now, since its founding in 2018, Vela has grown to become the continent's largest crypto exchange by trading volume, processing more than $10 billion from more than 500,000 customers. The company has also successfully raised more than $55 million from leading investors and is now eyeing a new wave of growth through international expansion. And then uh, we saw this explosive growth of traders coming in and about a year or 12 to 16 months, we had the largest market share in the country. Mm. And uh, also, (laughs) I don't know how that happened, but I think there were a few things that were playing Mm. in our favor. Mm. Now in Africa, the financial systems of many nations are still at the mercy of ineffective governments, volatile currencies, and the inability of citizens to securely transact, save, and invest. And sadly, these issues are made even worse by things like corruption and a lack of trust. Now it's for these reasons that enthusiasts initially began and continue to advocate strongly for the relevance of blockchain technology and cryptocurrencies in the African context. Now, despite sub-Saharan Africa only accounting for between 2 to 3% of global transaction volumes, according to chain analysis, the relevance of crypto tech is proving itself truer by the day. With those in emerging markets realizing the day-to-day need for crypto, many of whom are turning to currencies like Bitcoin to protect against inflation and even debt in their home nations. In recognition of this opportunity, we've seen the rise of numerous Web3 startups hoping to enable the future of financial infrastructure. And one such company is Vela, the South African-founded crypto exchange, which since its founding in 2018 now enables more crypto trading on the African continent than anyone else and serves 500,000 retail customers and 900 institutions. It's also been a really big 18 months for Vela and its founding team, raising $50 million from investors, massive trading volumes, inking a partnership with Visa, and expanding to the likes of Asia and the Middle East. But of course, for its founders, the story doesn't start there. Badi Sudhakaran, Vela's co-founder and chief product officer, was born in India in the early 1980s. His father was a doctor and his mother was a teacher. Now curious by nature, Buddy would go on to study computer engineering at one of the country's top colleges, before landing his first job for global search engine giant Yahoo in the early 2000s. Nearly two decades and two countries later, Buddy has amassed expertise spanning blockchain, software development, product design and leadership. But it wasn't until he and his colleagues collided on a mutual passion for building an improved financial system for humanity that his true entrepreneurial flair would come to life. Yeah, like you said, I was born and brought up in India. Uh, India is a, a place quite uh, different to Africa. Sure. In fact, um, um, when I met my wife, uh, before she became my wife, um, she said uh, I, I wanted to take her to India, uh, travel around. Um, and she said, you know, India will be a piece of cake for me because... Uh, I've, I've lived in Africa yeah. and traveled around in African villages. And then she came to India. <laughs> so so it's a beautiful place yeah. with beautiful people. And uh, 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 the, the sense of community is very strong in, in India. Uh, but there are a lot of people, you know, as sometimes people who are not familiar with that kind of environment, when they get in or travel there, uh, they, all their senses are tested. Sure. You know, whether it's taste, smell. Or, yeah, it can be overwhelming. Yeah, it can mm-hmm. be overwhelming. Uh, but in that, in that uh, you know, someone once said, you know, when you, when you travel to India the first day, uh, you hate it. But by the time you're leaving, you're already planning your uh, trip back mm-hmm. to India. So mm-hmm. it's kind of a love-hate <laughs> relationship sure, with, uh, sure. with India. But uh, India t- tends to grow on you. So, in th- so I grew up uh, in, a, um, in a small town and... Uh, 
uh, you know, India also has many languages, many you know, cultures, mm. and many faiths. Uh, I grew up in a in a family who is Baha'i, and uh, and in as a Baha'i, uh, the concept of oneness of humanity and oneness of religion uh, was very strong from the, from a very young age. So I had friends from all faiths, mm. all languages, and mm. uh, um, so it was. It was a. Uh, I think lo- looking back, it was a happy childhood. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting because I know core at uh, core to Bella's mission today is this interest of serving humanity uh, in in its entirety, and so I, I've got no doubt that there have been some inclinations from from your upbringing and and who you are influencing that agenda. Um, tell us, you know, obviously now you are. Uh, an entrepreneur and you've built this uh, this business from scratch as a as a child were you enterprising were you the mm. kid who was selling sweets in the schoolyard or starting something <laughs> or you know taking off at a market or, or whatever it might be because not, mm. not everyone is actually that early i'm curious mm. to know no i don't think i was I, I wasn't selling sweets or trying to make a buck uh, um and i think the that came later on when I was a teenager, mm. uh, you know, talking with my cousins. At that time, I have many cousins sure. because my, my dad has 10 siblings. And wow. I have uh, first and second cousins put together. I have about 60 of them. So hanging out with them and uh, some of my cousins uh, twice my age at that time, going to university mm. and going to the U.S. to study and starting their own business or working for a multinational company. So they were all an inspiration at that time. And sure. I always wanted to do something uh, remarkable. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think I've done anything remarkable yet, but... Uh, <laughs> Certainly on the path, I, I think. <laughs> it started off maybe in my teen years. Sure. Then, uh, then very early childhood. Okay. Yeah. So you go to school at a Catholic convent in Bangalore. Um, were, you, were you studious? Were you always a good mm. student? Did you put your head down, get the good grades? Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. I think uh, one of the one of the things in India is that because there's uh, a lot of people mm. and uh, very few opportunities at the time of growing up, and the opportunities have exploded uh, in the past decade, but at that time in the 1980s and 1990s, um, you really, if you wanted to do something with your life, uh, I think the parents... Uh, were uh, emphasizing sure. a lot on education and doing your best sure. and you know getting the grades and being number one and that was uh, that was also the culture that I mm. uh, grew mm. up in my family so I always tried my best um, I was top of the class for most of my school years wow. yeah and did you have much choice in the matter of what you were going to be was there something when you Mm-hmm. When you woke up in the morning, you were like, "I'm going to be an ex." So I'm, you know, what, mm. what, what were what did what did you want to be post school, and was there a career ambition? Um, I think the first thing I remember I wanted to be was a pilot. Okay, yeah, <laughs> you know, you know, looking at the planes uh, flying sure. in the air, and I wanted to be a pilot. Um, but I think, um, as I, as I said, in my teen years, as I was hanging out with my cousins and and seeing what was what was trending at that time. And I think in the 1990s, computers, mm. um, programming, computer engineering mm. became uh, quite hot. And, uh, and a lot of jobs were, uh, were created in India mm. around that uh, industry. Uh, many services companies uh, were established. So, so, you know, I think that kind of led me to want to be uh, a computer engineer sure sure so, so i started pursuing that and uh, did my engineering degree amazing yeah so yeah 1999 to 2003 you study software engineering at the rv college of engineering which i believe is one of the uh, most credible um computer study institutions uh, colleges uh, in india uh, graduate talk to us about buddy is now a graduated student Mm -hmm. uh presumably a a competent engineer at the end of this four-year stint the contextually the time we're really at the 
you know, kind of the peak and then the burst, uh, but nonetheless, the prevalence of the tech bubble, big internet giants, search giants, uh, global advertising mm -hmm. giants, um, and, and almost the formative years of what we now see as the modern tech age. So naturally, like you're saying, huge demand in the job space. Presumably, you've graduated well and you have your choice. Um, you end up going to Yahoo, which mm -hmm. at the time, of course, was probably a, a bigger name than it is now. Um, talk to us about that decision uh, to, mm. to join a, a global search giant like a Yahoo and, and how that came about. Yeah, so I think the institution that I studied in RV College of Engineering uh, was the, one of the top 10 universities in, uh, in India at the time. And uh, a lot of uh, IT companies uh, based in India, as well as over uh, multinational companies would come to recruit engineers from that university. So it was a four-year degree, but in my third year, um, already companies were coming in, mm. doing tests and interviews and and I, I landed a job uh, not in Yahoo at that time. In, in my third year of engineering degree, I already had a job offer wow. to um, start when I graduate. And uh, I do remember when I got the offer letter that night, I couldn't sleep. And I was like, wow. Someone's going to pay me for <laughs> skills I have. Wow. Yeah. So I was like looking at the numbers. And, and you know, I'd, so I'd, until that time, I had never uh, earned uh that kind of money sure. and it was it was incredible and mm. uh i was um beside myself to get that job offer i got reading that letter over and over and over and trying to <laughs> figure out what it means and yes so and then after it kind of like settled um you know so the university had a had a, a procedure if you had a job offer then uh then you weren't eligible to apply for others unless it's your dream company. Sure. Right. Because you have to give other people opportunities course, to also get a course. job. So, so there were many other companies that came and went, but uh, when Yahoo came and I think uh, I was like, okay, this, this is the company mm, I want to mm. uh, pursue to see if I can get in. And it was a quite a tough uh, interview process. Sure. So there were multiple rounds of, um, interviews and programming tests and and then uh, puzzle solving uh, exercises and going to the going to their offices and meeting the engineers mm, and mm. so those it was quite involved and uh, i wasn't sure if it was i was going to get it um so this was probably six or eight months after i already had my sure. first job offer okay. and uh and as fate would have it uh, i think they liked me and uh, they gave me an offer mm -hmm. and uh I was over the moon. So now I had to figure out how to say no to yeah. the <laughs> But yes. uh, I, I, did, I did say no to the yeah. other company that I had offer from. And, and I was so eager to start mm. Mm. because uh, I finished my exam, the last exam that I had, uh, fourth year, uh, eighth semester. And then the next day I started working at Yahoo. So I didn't want a break or anything. Sure, sure. <laughs> it was... Uh, it was a it was a it was a great uh, time at that time. Yeah, you obviously end up spending four years of your life um, mm. at what is a global internet giant, it's an amazing business. I can only imagine as a first inverted commas real job uh, post studying uh, that must have just been the most incredible immersion into. Mm. Uh, and probably in, in the best senses and also maybe the worst senses, right? Mm. Um, this corporate giant. I mean, maybe talk to us about what, what does that do, you think, in terms of your frame of mind? Because naturally mm. this is a Silicon Valley headquarters business, big mm. operation in India. You know, what, how would you surmise that four-year experience and being thrust into this environment of, mm. of a company like that? The fir my first uh, reaction was that uh, I don't deserve to be here mm. <laughs> because everybody was so smart and uh, yeah. very highly skilled. And I, I was working with a team based in Sunnyvale. Uh, so, um, so we kind of overlapped for a few hours a day and then we would uh, work and then we regroup and, uh, and do stuff like that. And uh, so the guys I worked uh, from, the engineers and my manager who was based in Sunnyvale was just amazing mm. uh, people and amazing engineers very technically sound and um 
and very accommodating for for a newcomer like me. And even at the time when I joined this company in Bangalore, we we were only fifty people. Mm-hmm. By the time I left, uh, four years later, there were thousand five hundred people wow. in in the Bangalore office. So it was still like a fifty people company. Still, everybody knows everybody mm-hmm. else. Mm-hmm. There's a ping pong table. There's a pool table. There's everything. Mm-hmm. You know, Startup like culture. <laughs> Startup. Yes. Yes. So, so it was a great culture. Great people. Um, learned a lot. Um, and I aspire to be uh, like those engineers. Mm. And many of those uh, engineers who I kind of either interacted with or exchanged an email with, some of them went on to be entrepreneurs themselves mm. uh, in many, many respects. Um, I can think of at least 10 of them. And not- most notably, the founder of WhatsApp was wow. also at, uh, at Yahoo at that time. Wow. I do recall exchanging an email with, uh, with Brian Acton. So it was uh, <laughs> it was uh, it was an interesting As environment. Interesting four years. Mm. Learned a lot, and um, yeah, I would say I achieved quite a bit. Sure. Yeah. Obviously, it's a it's a decent chunk of your career. Uh, four years at Yahoo. Uh, in two thousand and eight, you decide to not only move country but move organization. What what, what were you restless? Mm. Um, at the company, did you want a new challenge? What what was prompting that uh, that move? I kind of took a gap year uh, sure. after four years at Yahoo. You know, so Yahoo had given me some stock options, and uh, um, it was life was comfortable, and financially it was also comfortable. And I felt like something is missing, sure. <laughs> so it, I should be uncomfortable, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, mm. so. I took a gap year um, and spent that year in China, actually. Wow. Yeah, I went and lived in Macau for a year. I was an uh, administrator, um, like an IT administrator for, for a school, and wow. also teaching programming to the kids and maths to high school students. Um, made some really good connections at mm. that time. Mm. So, um, and then I realized teaching is not uh, my cup of tea, sure. <laughs> teaching kids. Yes. <laughs> so, yes. so I spent a year there, but okay. it was a great environment to be, um, great people to, mm. work, to work mm. with. Uh, it, was, it was also a Baha'i-inspired sure. school. Sure. So it was a values-driven organization um, uh, in you know, inculcating uh, values and morals into mm. kids. And mm. it, was, it, was, it was really good. And Macau was also a good city to live in. Sure. Um, but uh, it wasn't for me, so uh, I had to leave, and uh, and then that's when I went to Israel. Okay, yeah, it's interesting because you're still in your mid twenties, mm. uh, so I guess that's in some respects a mid mid life crisis, and <laughs> uh, that you you also know that you want to do something more, right? You could have mm. stayed, I'm sure, at a Yahoo and yeah. built up exceptional stock and probably figured it out and retired early. But mm. um, you know, m- much credit to you that uh, I think it's that again that curiosity. Mm. Um, to make sure all the boxes are checked and not just the financial ones. Um, post Macau, uh, you spend a couple of years in Israel for the Baha'i World Center. And um, why Israel? And was that mm. just an extension of the, the, the sabbatical you, you had taken? Or what, what, what prompted the move? It was a bit of both. Um, I was um, at a crossroads at that time. Sure. So I could go back to India or go somewhere else. Um, restart my IT career or start something else. Uh, but I felt like um, I wanted to spend a little bit of time uh, serving uh, and not really thinking about making money at that sure. time. Uh, as, as you said, um, uh, one of the core principles of the Baha'i faith is service, mm. you know, spending time, giving your time for service and uh, spending your energy to do something that will help a lot of people. And, uh, and so I offered to serve at the Baha'i World Center um, as a software engineer. So, so they, they have an a IT department and I, where wow. they had a need for someone to build software for a line of business applications. Mm. Uh, so I have offered and uh, they accepted my offer and uh, that is when uh, I think it was late 2008, I decided uh, to go to Israel. And uh, I initially had planned to spend two and a half years 
but um, I spent uh, a total of three years there. Yep. And that's where I met my wife. Amazing. And, yeah. At the center? Yeah, she was. Amazing. She was, she had come from South Africa and sure. I had come from Macau and we met there. Ironically, she is a teacher, yeah. <laughs> even, though, even though you didn't have an affinity for it. She, yeah, yeah, there we go. yeah, exactly. Well, we, we got to know each other there. Amazing. We got married there. And uh, at the end of our uh, service, um, <clears throat> we, we uh, were contemplating where to go. Mm. You know, I think we had several options, uh, US being one of them. Uh, South Africa, the other one in India, the third option. So, so for whatever reason, we decided, you know, South Africa is the way, is the sure, way to go. Sure, so sure. in 2012, we moved to South Africa oh. after that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, a big move. And again, by this mm. point in your life, you've lived in multiple countries um, and probably gone on more of a career journey than, than most people, certainly not mm. a long, uh, certainly a non-linear career. Um, you arrived back in South Africa, 2012, uh, late 2012. Early, um, early 2012. Uh, brilliant, early, excuse me. And um, in that move, you join IQ Business, I believe, um, initially in, as an engineer and then grow into a software lead. I mean, of course, the question, and sometimes we don't know the answer to this necessarily, is why South Africa? And you've kind of said, for, for whatever reason, we chose South <laughs> Africa. Um, I'm curious to know why why uh, IQ Business was there anything pulling you there? You do spend about five years mm -hmm. uh, at the business, um, yeah, yeah. So I think South moving to South Africa is is a not not easy, especially exactly. uh, <laughs> uh, given the um, nature of uh, employment here. Mm. Um, so we, I did, I did have a couple of offers at that time. Uh, but I chose IQ Business because I think uh, given being in a consulting space seemed like the right thing for me to, sure. be, to be exposed to different industries uh, and different projects and uh, have, have a lot more experience than mm -hmm. just doing one mm -hmm. thing for many mm -hmm. years. So that is exactly what happened with IQ. I think I worked on many, many projects uh, there um, from banks, banks to diamond mines. So uh, it was it was a great experience, great mm -hmm. great set of people. They uh, they were very again uh, a good employer. Yeah. Uh, very accommodating to someone like me who has come new to South Africa, and uh, um, so I was uh, I was able to um, work on several things and learn learn from the people and contribute mm -hmm. however much mm -hmm. I could. Yeah. Amazing. And on the personal front, of course, this is five years and we're doing a little bit of disservice because we've pretty much covered a decade of your life already <laughs> in only a couple of minutes. Um, you do also have your kids uh, in mm. this stint, I believe, whilst mm -hmm. you're at IQ. Yeah. Um, five years is one of the longer stints of your life at a specific corporate or a specific employer. So I can only presume it was good and the exposure was good as well. Um, 2017, you, you moved to... You actually leave IQ business and you join RMB. Mm. Um, and again, at the time, contextually, uh, the world had already been introduced to blockchain. Uh, Bitcoin had kind of come and gone in some of its popularity, and we'd seen massive peaks and massive troughs. And this does become relevant in the context of your next role uh, with the bank and obviously your role into, into starting your own venture. Um, Talk to us about this move to R&B. What was the mm. thing that, again, was it just that curiosity? Was it the technical uh, alignment to what you were good at or interested in? Um, mm. This is 2017, and it yeah. becomes quite a profound year of your life. Absolutely. Yeah, I joined uh, R&B in 2017, but uh, my interest in blockchain started in 2016, um, and and I knew for some uh, before sure. through the Baha'i community because sure. Prasam sure. is also a Baha'i and so we would see each other in various activities and community gatherings and dinners and I do recall this one dinner uh, it was uh, we were standing it was after dinner and we were just standing and chatting in the garden and and uh, I expressed to him you know I think I'd like to see if there's an opportunity to work with you in the blockchain space mm -hmm. at RMB because Farzam was R&B blockchain lead at that yes, time. Yes, yes. 
And that was probably uh, around September, October 2016. So the conversation started then. And then uh, then he invited me to the office and I spoke to the team. And then I did a um, test and a, <laughs> and, and a recruitment uh, process. Mm. Mm. Uh, but there were also some hiccups. You know, there were some visa hiccups sure. and you know, like work sure. work permit hiccups yeah. and things like that. So it went on for several months. So from October 2016 all the way, I think by the time I started was either April or May uh, in 2017. Uh, so so I started uh, very very excited because uh, I do uh, I did see the value of blockchain mm. and crypto mm. as a force for good in the world. Uh, especially given the fragmented financial system that mm. we live in, not mm. just in Africa, but across the globe, and uh, and the need for uh, something apolitical, something um, that's seamless, uh, that's cheap, mm. and uh, yeah. and it's accessible to anyone with a with access to a computer or a phone, uh, which is unlike uh, anything that we've seen in sure. the financial system. Sure. So. So it was a very exciting time, uh, time at that time. And mm -hmm. then uh, as it turns out, as I, as I joined, uh, uh, his team had left. And so he was still beef beefing up his, uh, his team. And Theo and Chris joined at around the same time. Sure. So we kind of all uh, converged around the same time mm -hmm. and started mm -hmm. this whole new team. Uh, still block, uh, for as I'm at the lead. Um, so it was a good a few months. And I didn't last there long. I <laughs> Sure. And, we'll, and we'll get into that in a couple of seconds. I think uh, the one thing, obviously, is credit to probably R and B and the first round group more broadly mm, speaking. Absolutely. You know, to set up a team like that and to start mm. exploring really this new wave of innovation as one of the biggest financial institutions on the continent mm. um, is, you know, hats hats off to them. Uh, talk to me about you know what was the nature of your task in mm. this blockchain team? It didn't last long, and we'll talk about the why in a second, but what did they? What was the brief? You mm -hmm. know, Fazam, Buddy, Theo, Chris, guys, build. Or what, what? What? What was the brief? Was it just to explore projects or maybe use cases for the bank uh, or banks applications at a later stage? Mm. Um, talk to us about the mandate there. I think there was um, there was a mandate to explore uh, opportunities in crypto on blo blockchain space in okay. the banking space, um, and I think there's always this. Is it crypto or is it blockchain? Yes, you know, I think yes. I think some people are pro blockchain mm. uh, related use cases. Some people are more more crypto. But as you, as we know, you know, in terms of the blockchain and crypto space, crypto is the only non proof of concept mm. that has so far worked. And I think uh, we were in the pro crypto um, camp, sure. <laughs> sure. Uh, but we were still mandated with uh, researching. Uh, blockchain related use cases like trade finance and um, and and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So so we did many uh, proof of concepts and research and we went to conferences. <clears throat> we went to conferences and uh, I think one of those conferences that we went to would be pivotal mm -hmm. in uh, mm -hmm. in starting uh, Valor later on. But uh, I think the uh, the idea ultimately was how do we build something from this team that can be integrated into a banking app sure and uh, and i think we we were fairly close in terms of what we built mm. and uh, mm. we were proud of what we we could achieve at that time mm, amazing yeah. thanks for tuning into today's episode we're going to take a quick break and if you're enjoying today's show don't forget to like and subscribe it really helps us boost our reach I'm Matthew Marsden, and this is the Startup Club podcast. Now, again, contextually for our listeners who um, are not blockchain or crypto enthusiasts and uh, may not be South African, South Africa had quite a high adoption rate of specifically Bitcoin uh, at the time. The market has a large incumbent mo monopolizing the crypto exchange space, and that's in, in the Luna business. And so... I'd love for you just to expand on, you know, you guys are by mandate exploring these different applications and trying to identify gaps. You're building technology as well. You've got the competency to do so. 
where is the gap that you then see that, uh, and we will get into that conference anecdote you've uh, mentioned a few seconds ago, where is the gap that you see, um, hey, there, there's actually something we want to build here and it can't necessarily happen in this environment. Mm. Um, we, we, we need to start something of our own. Talk to us about that transition mm. to go from employed folks working on projects mm. to, hey, we actually need to, to branch off on our own. Yeah. <laughs> That is a um, interesting period of my life um, because uh, I really saw the opportunity with uh, with me and uh, Theo, Chris, and uh, at that time, and uh, seeing that we had the the skills mm. and the knowledge to build something for South Africa, and it didn't seem like the the bank was ready at that time to do something mm. with crypto or blockchain especially with the regulatory uncertainties and uh, the volatility of the crypto sure, space, sure. it is quite understandable. Uh, so, and I think, uh, as I recall, I was, uh, I approached Theo first mm. and, uh, and I said, you know, let's start something. And uh, he was like, yeah, let's do it. He had no uh, second thoughts whatsoever. <laughs> and, uh, and then, and that's when we started putting pitch decks together sure. and talking to some investors and so on. And, uh, and did you have an idea at the time that you were like, here's, here's mm. cause what was the gap? What was the gap you saw? You had a mm. incumbent player who mm. for, the, for the most part, you know, well-known household name, yeah. um, crypto space was highly volatile as well, price wise. And so maybe a lot of folks were a little bit more uh, risk averse uh, of entering at these new new players mm. uh, new customers what was the gap you saw and, and how did you want to attack the problem i think the gap there was um there are ma there were many international uh, crypto exchanges mm. <clears throat> that that uh, offered customers many more assets to choose from and many different ways to trade mm. and uh and and so that wasn't possible for South African customers. I, at, as I recall, it was just Bitcoin. Sure. And then a few months later, it was just Bitcoin and ETH Ethereum. Yes, yes. So my idea at that time was, you know, we want to launch a product that has 50 cryptocurrencies mm -hmm. to offer mm -hmm. and uh, a simple interface and an advanced interface an API and API and, oh. and a mobile app uh, to go along with it. So... And the fees, I think the the clincher was the fees because at that time the uh, customers in South Africa were paying 100 basis points mm. for, mm. for trades. Uh, and when we did launch and we started Valor and launch, we came with a much, much lower fee structure, which sure. kind of saw um, an influx of customers because of that. Of course. So I think there were many different gaps and fees was one of them. And uh, yeah, so okay. that was... Okay, so uh, you've approached uh, Chris originally, or was no, it Theo? Theo, excuse me. Yeah. No, no reservations. Let's do this, buddy. Yeah. Um, contextually, though, I think you didn't exactly have the funding to launch a, a mm -hmm. startup. Um, I understand that all four who would become the four founders all have kids at the time, um, and so you know. I think there is this maybe misunderstanding or misnomer where folks have got it all settled and it's an easy transition into, cool, we've now got the luxury of starting this business. Uh, but clearly that wasn't the case. There was a mm. passion here. There was a gap. It was maybe right timing, right people, right skills. But just talk to us about, A, how you get Fazam and Chris involved uh, mm. once the two of you are aligned and how you go to starting this business, actually starting mm. it, funding it, mm. like maybe transitioning out of, employment into starting this thing uh i'm yeah. sure our, our our listeners are on the edge of their seats trying to figure <laughs> this out because that's that's typically the thing that stops people mm. from jumping into something that that could be could be it's the true, next, it's uh, true. next venture so i say that the best time to start a business is when you're a teenager sure because then you don't have any um uh, responsibilities yes, you can yes. crash on someone's couch and you still hustle around and you have a lot of time and uh and the next best time is now, right? So I think um, having ki having kids to take care of, paying the school fees is is a is a big ask. Mm. Uh, and when you're starting a business, 
So I think one of the uh, things that we wanted to do is raise the funding uh, as early as possible sure. pre-product. Um, and at the time, it just worked out that way. Mm. We were so lucky mm. that mm. Uh, the timing was right. The crypto market was booming. The opportunity was there. The competition was monopolized here. And everything was coming together that the we did secure funding. Um, even though we had verbally secured funding, mm. we the funding didn't really come mm. until about three months in. Uh, so it was a tough time for, for all of us with uh, having to uh, feed the kids. <laughs> but by this <laughs> point, had you, had you convinced uh, Fazam and Chris? To yeah, join? This, yeah, yeah, maybe just going back a little yes. bit there. So um, we had, I had one investor that I had uh, got in touch with uh, via that conference that I mentioned in, in Mexico, and uh, and so I had uh, a few emails and a few calls, and then Theo and I were on on, a, on on one or two calls with them, and they were very interested. And I just want to. Again, contextualize that you had met this investor just coincidentally at this conference in Mexico. You were there to explore, mm -hmm. uh, and you said, "Hey, I've got this idea." And he said, <laughs> well, "No, we. I, I didn't even <laughs> meet. I didn't even meet the investor. I okay. met someone who knew the investor. Okay, and uh, the guy said, "You know, I know this uh, the CEO of this company, and they're exploring uh, expanding their offering mm -hmm. around the world." And they don't necessarily want to go and establish everything everywhere. In but if you are going to establish something in South mm. Africa, mm. they might be interested. So a couple of emails through LinkedIn. It's not even an email uh, address that I mm. got through LinkedIn, and uh, uh, and I got an email address and then a contact with the Amazing. chief strategy officer there. And um, so after that, we got on a few calls, and uh, so we said. Uh, and I was trying to do calculations and modeling and, and <laughs> sure. thinking about, it's okay, how much runway yes. do we need? Yes. When when we'll be able to launch the product? How many people? Things like that. And I came to conclusion that maybe we need a half a million dollars of funding. Sure. And I had mentioned that in one of the calls and the guy on the other side said, yeah, I think that's doable. So that was Theo and uh, my journey. And I had a pitch deck. I still have that, a copy of that wow. pitch deck. And it was wow. not called Vala. And it, it, it was a different name that I have thought <laughs> <Sure>. of. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I, I assume it wasn't nearly as good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that was very good. Yeah. And, um, but parallelly, I think Farzam also had his own journey uh, mm. at RMB. Mm. And he had come to the conclusion that uh, it was also time for him to leave. So he approached uh, Theo and I uh, saying, okay, let's start something. And then, then we disclosed to him that, oh, by the way, we, we are wow. far along here. Um, we, we've got an investor, we've, ha we've got a few calls, uh, we've got the pitch deck. Mm, uh, mm. so then it became three of us from two of us to three of us. Yes, yes. And, uh, then we put our heads together. We, uh, refined the pitch deck further. We got on the calls and for some raised the uh, bar and he said, I think we really need one and a half million dollars, mm, not mm. half a million dollars. And then the person on the other said, yeah, I think that's doable too. <laughs> So, so I think Farzam is a great uh, negotiator and sure. a convincer, and he's a great storyteller. Mm. And um, and it was good to have him on, have him have him on board. Mm. Mm. Um, and then I think um, we it was time to resign from uh, from RMB. And uh, had you started? I mean, you were building this product after hours, presumably. No, and no. Or, they, or were we still pre-product at this point? Yeah, it's still yeah, pre-product. Because the cash hadn't landed. No, we didn't. Okay. We cash hadn't landed pre-product, yeah. and we didn't want to write a single line of code before mm. we actually officially yeah, left of the course, bank. Of course. Um, so we resigned. Um, I think Farzam resigned first, and then Theo and I resigned next, um, and then we were on um, uh, um, one month of uh, leave. Um, and finally, we started, I think Farzam started in April 2018, and Theo and I started in May 2018. And then Chris, uh, so we were talking to Chris during this mm -hmm. time, and then mm -hmm. he joined like the second week of May. So at, by the second week of May, we had the whole co-founding mm -hmm. team together. Mm -hmm. by, by the, so the journey was, um, yes, we have the investor. Yes, we have the team. Yes, we have the idea. Yes, we have the opportunity. But the investor was like, 
but you guys are still employed at mm. the bank uh, unless and until you leave and you start there's nothing we can do so 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 without a promise of money in the bank mm. uh, and I mean, there wasn't a term sheet here signed guaranteed right no, so there no. was there was a risk yeah there was yeah. a risk and we and and the w- wives and kids to feed uh, we took the leap we took the leap and uh, Amazing. I do I do <laughs> there's one interesting funny an- anecdote uh, when we resigned actually actually F- Farzam resigned and then he, he we had a whatsapp group for the three of us and he's like guys I've resigned and then <laughs> Theo, Theo message is saying you know um, I think I need a little bit more time to just <laughs> think about this <laughs> Sure. And then, and then uh, later on, we recall that incident, and uh, Farzam uh, tells me this thing about you know we are all standing on the top of a cliff, and we were like, okay, guys, we're we're gonna jump off, right? Yes, yes, we're gonna jump off. And then once he's jumped off, <laughs> and he's looking back, he's like, okay, you go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's it's high from here. Actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but anyway, it was uh, it was just uh, lasted probably 24 hours and mm. Theo said yes I think uh, amazing yeah no looking back since then yeah. buddy tell me you've you've left now and uh, again building a product is one thing of course you have a commitment of capital presumably now that you're all out purchase investor he's able to wire you funds uh, and you start building mm. talk to us about you know, uh, and what you've um, told me in the past, it took you nine months to build your mm-hmm. first product, which is actually really quick. Uh, I'm sure you had insights from a lot of the stuff you'd already been working on. And again, it's this beautiful culmination of all the skill sets coming together. Talk to us about maybe that build process and deciding to actually launch. Mm. Well, I'm very fortunate to have the co-founders that I have. Um, uh, we are all uh, highly values driven and uh, highly skilled, um, and I I am very fortunate uh, to be working with uh, with the people like that. Mm. At that time, uh, you know, uh, Theo was is one of the best engineers that I've ever met. He's our CTO, and he's a, he's a whiz kid. He can he can transform any idea into code uh, super fast. Mm. And uh, Chris had been a security engineer for 17 years, uh, built security systems for uh, banks like Investec. Um, so, and we at that time, from the very get go, we were building a security company, not a crypto company, mm. and a security mm. company that offers crypto ex- as a crypto exchange wow. as a service. So we needed that kind of skill. And. Um, Farzam was an economist, and uh, he's really deeply entrenched into the crypto space, and he was well known. And uh, at, and he, we also, I forgot to mention, we also got an angel funding from Michael Jordan, sure. who's the ex-CEO of FNB. Sure, he had lived by that time. Yeah, and yeah. yeah, through Farzam's connection. And, uh, and uh, so the four of us uh, were able to go very fast mm. because of the skills that we had. And we had a goal to launch something in six months, but it took nine months. And uh, um, at, in, in during these nine months, we kind of contracted a couple of people for testing, sure. and uh, and uh, we hired one more full time engineer, also ex RMB. And uh, so it was just the five of us and a couple of other contractors working towards uh, the first launch of the mm-hmm. product. Mm-hmm. Um, I did. Uh, I did mention that you know the, the first three months of the build, we didn't have any mm. promise of the money coming sure. in, uh, sure. but it did come through, uh, and it was like a breath of fresh air for all of us, and uh, we could breathe while we were coding, and and uh, it was a it was a good time, and we have pictures of that time and in, cramped into a, a little office mm. that was also given us uh, given to us from an incubator at that time called Blockstarters. They were trying to incubate companies in the blockchain space uh, in Rivonia. So it was uh, incredibly um, hard time because it was a lot of time invested, mm. very little time for family. And uh, I, I, can, I can say that every, uh, all the 
of the wives and kids have made some sacrifices uh, during that so time. So I was going to ask you that. You yeah. obviously can't speak on behalf of the other wives, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, you had young kids mm-hmm. at this point. Um, your two boys being raised by your lovely wife. How, how did she feel mm-hmm. uh, about this jump into something new and was she completely supportive from day one? And mm. Especially during the first three months, I haven't taken a salary and yes, those yeah. sorts of things. How, how, how did that go? Because that, again, outside of the funding, I think... If you are married, I, I consider it a superpower. I actually mm. think being married to a great enabling spouse who's saying go for it, it's just it, it settles something in you as a founder. Um, other people are saying, well, gosh, you know, to do this, it's going to put way too much strain on the relationship. What, what, are, what is your perspective? Mm. My wife was uh, super supportive from, from day one. And uh, she always said, you know, you have, you have to do this. Otherwise, you'll probably regret mm. not doing it mm. in, in the future. So... Whether funding or no funding, <laughs> and she had full full faith, uh, and also we draw comfort in 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 this collaboration. You know, I think having having the right kind of people with the right kind of values mm-hmm. banding together also gives a, a comfort that you know these thing these people getting together with the right framework mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. mind and uh, right foundation they will be able to achieve. And if, sure, if not, sure. you know, we still have the skills. We can That's always it. go back to the job market. That's it. So, so she was very, very supportive. And it was hard uh, while we were grinding, mm. uh, but very supportive. Amazing. Yeah. So nine months later, Bella 1.0, talk to us about launch day. I have read that uh, you had close to a thousand accounts opened on day one. And... Uh, that obviously might speak to the relevance of the proposition and the price point and those sorts of things. Typically for founders, launch mm. day never goes to plan. Mm. Uh, talk to us about maybe what launch day was like for, for the Valor <laughs> team and uh, yeah, what, what you took well, away from actually, it. Well, there, actually, there are, if I think about it, there, are, there were two launch days. The first launch day was uh, in December. It was only um, maybe six, seven months in. Um, but it was not a full product. It was just a wait list for for to see the reaction of the of the of the market. So we had a landing page, we had a public website, and we had a sign up page, and uh, uh, and I do recall. I think there was also um, our KYC system to uh, to. KYC our sure. users on board and bet and yeah um, if I recall correctly yeah so that was in December December sixth mm. of twenty eighteen wow. so we launched we had no product we didn't have an exchange you, you couldn't buy anything sure. <laughs> sure, sure it was just a hey we are going to be launching mm. uh, do you want to be on the wait list or do you want to just uh, get ahead of uh, the rest of the crowd on that day we had thousand signups. Mm. And uh, many uh, bugs are discovered. Sure. <laughs> sure. Okay, so so we had okay. If if you are signing up and if you are on this device, the OTP doesn't work, or if you are on that device, the Chrome, and then this, and so there were quite a few things to mm. uh, to sort out, mm. and uh, and we sorted that out, and we built. The, By the way, I must say, I think that's consolation for many founders <laughs> because <laughs> even to hear that in such a confident team with all the skills and yeah. the funding. Yeah. Uh, albeit limited right away. <laughs> uh, to know that that stuff still happens, mm-hmm. I think, is a great encouragement. It happens to everyone. Yeah, uh, just a yeah, word for our true. listeners. It's true. Uh, sorry, continue. So the so the main launch event. No, it was not just a um, sign up mm-hmm. and s- mm-hmm. see where it goes kind of thing. It was main launch event was in February of twenty nineteen. Uh, uh, February of twenty nineteen, and uh, we announced that actually Fazam announced that. In the conference, uh, Blockchain Africa conference, he was emceeing, and he had asked the organizers if he could make an announcement. And I still have the video of that announcement Amazing. where we said, "Okay." Uh, so we actually went early uh, into the conference, and we were uh, we had printed this flyer, uh, and were stuck sticking it under uh, under the seat of every single participant there before anyone comes. And we <laughs> and and so it was kind of a uh, surprise reveal mm. that we wanted to mm. do so like look under your seat you know you'll find this and yes, take yes. that to the our counter and you'll get a 50 rand worth of no we said 
take your share of 10,000 rand worth of Bitcoin. Mm. So that was our first announcement. Wow. Okay. <laughs> so again, uh, a lot of lessons to be learned. And uh, so we were uh, four of us or uh, two or three of us were sitting at the booth and after after the announcement was made, there was like a whole bunch of people around mm, us mm. signing up, signing up, signing up, signing up, and then asking for uh, their share of Bitcoin. And I'm sure that 50 rand of Bitcoin that we gave uh, people is worth uh, much, much more than yes, that yes, <laughs> today. Of course, of course. <laughs> today, yeah. So that was uh, that was launch uh, 1.0. Yeah, but still, it was it is not a product that would actually put us into the limelight mm-hmm. because it mm-hmm. was still a simple buy sell interface where someone would come and then um buy um crypto with a simple interface mm. with the higher mm. fees but really what we were building towards is a very advanced exchange where you could put limit orders into the exchange uh, and also get uh, rewarded for market making on the on the platform sure. and uh, so that came in june so that's launch one point Five. Yes, yes. So in June 2019, and that was the turning point for us. The, the iterations are incredibly quick, mm-hmm. only to, to your mm-hmm. credit. Um, and again, I think that speaks to just having the right team to be able to pivot that early uh, and add that early. Um, you know, uh, we're, I, I'm interested uh, to hear about how uh, the business grew in COVID-19 and things like that. Um, uh, again, crypto as a broader uh, asset class was still highly volatile, and so you had maybe a lot of people entering the market who were slightly novice. And um, just again, it's an interesting market at the time in which all of this is happening. Maybe talk to us about, like you said, you've launched the sophisticated 1.5 launch uh, exchange. Um, obviously, you've uh, moved to offering more coins than anyone else, so you can trade more assets, crypto assets, than anyone else. You also offer Vela Pay. Uh, which is more to a peer-to-peer patron uh, solution and uh, some of the lowest fees, if not the lowest fees in the market to do so. Um, talk to us about what all of that does. So June 2019, and I'm curious, you know, you have explosive growth. That's been well documented, I think, for the next 18 months, two years. You're, in some respects, you're still living through that growth today. Um, what was it like? How did you, how did you handle the influx? Mm. Um, mm. The influx wasn't like overnight. Okay. So June 2019, June 11, 2019, we launched Bitcoin RAND trading in the advanced interface. And uh, so Farzam and I were on the support desk <laughs> and uh, we were uh, replying to customer queries and uh, slowly things were looking uh, like it was picking up. Mm. Some customers took notice and started moving their trading to us from other computing platforms, and it slowly started building. And I think, uh, if I recall correctly, the first day, uh, it was a good day. It mm. was, I think, 10 BTC worth of trading, and we were like, wow, we didn't think that we we would be doing such mm. such amount of trading. And uh, it slowly grew. It wasn't an overnight success. Mm. Um, and probably one of the differentiating factors is that at that time, or even to this day, uh, a lot of the exchanges don't offer something called the maker rewards. Sure. So we had very low fees, but also a fee for market makers. Mm, the incentive. We are actually paying the market makers for trading on mm, Bala. Mm. And uh, that seemed to be a, a super hit mm. amongst traders. And and they started building the um, their positions uh, in, in Valor for in the next three months. Then we started, we saw this hockey stick happen. Amazing. So from June 2019, uh, so we launched um, Bitcoin RAND trading and then Ethereum RAND trading the next uh, next month and then XRP uh, RAND trading the following month. And then uh, we saw this explosive growth of traders coming in. And about a year or 12 to 16 months, we had the largest market share in the country. Mm. And uh, also, <laughs> I don't know how that happened, but I think there were a few things that were playing mm, in our favor. Mm, so mm. we had launched our mobile app by sure, them. Sure. Uh, so even to this day, uh, the number of users on our mobile app is far greater than on the website. But but we also started seeing a lot of people plugging in their 
uh, automated trading using their API Amazing. into us. So, so there was a lot of these things kind of like added mm. up, added up, mm. added up. And then we were like at the forefront of uh, crypto trading in South mm. Africa. Mm. And, and talk to me about um, COVID because, you know, mm. we, we, we'd be remiss if we didn't ask our guests about how that season affected their business positively, negatively, and how they just coped. I think Vela has always had uh, a remote first culture. So I don't think that might mm. have affected you workforce wise, but um, yeah, any, any takeaways from that season that might be yeah. uh, interesting to our audience? We were not remote first in the beginning. Oh, okay. Yeah, so... Uh, mind you, you were on the support desk, so clearly <laughs> not. Yes. Yeah. So we, COVID actually opened up a lot of opportunities for hiring talent, sure. not just in Joburg, but in Cape Town and overseas. Mm. Because at that time, our thinking was, you know, if we can't work with an engineer who's sitting next to us, we, we cannot mm. really build a team. So that was our thinking. But 20, 2020, um, lockdown in March, and we, uh, w at this time, we were paying rent for our office premises uh, in Rivonia, and we terminated that lease. And then we said, okay, we're going to be working from home. That kind of opened up a lot of opportunities. Sure. Now, uh, so I was, apart from being a uh, support desk, I was also mm. the chief recruiting officer because I was recruiting a lot of engineers for, mm. for mm. the business. So until about, we reached about 40, I was mainly doing all the recruitment and then we got some recruiters after that. Um, so at that time, I was trying to get on LinkedIn, get in here, get in there, mm. get in there, trying to get uh, engineers to come and uh, interview with us. But the options were limited just looking at Joburg. But now I could look at engineers mm. in Cape Town mm. or anywhere else. And then we were able to really grow the engineering talent. Amazing. And um, so that actually worked out really well. <clears throat> COVID um, triggered a lot of money printing mm. across mm. the globe. And a lot of that money kind of um, went into the stock market, went into the crypto space. And we were seeing explosive uh, growth in mm. both in terms mm. of users and volumes and and uh, retail uh, customers coming in because uh, the Bitcoin prices were uh, reaching all-time highs mm. and it had breached the previous all-time high of 20K and it was going 30, 40, 50, 60s uh, and then all, all the way to 70. So so that also kind of helped us, you know, sure. I think uh, so there were many businesses during COVID that suffered, but we our business actually thrived during uh, during COVID. Mm -hmm. So our volumes grew, our customers grew, the uh, the prices were also helping mm -hmm. helping that kind of growth. Did you raise more capital at this point? I know you've got a bigger round that we'll talk about. Um, was yes. there an interim uh, raise as well, just to fill yes. some of this hiring? So we did do a Series A okay. at that time of yep. uh, three and a half, three point four million dollars. Sure. So that uh, that also helped us to hire more people yep. and hire more staff, uh, support staff. And uh, so I think we were ab ab around 40 people okay. at the uh, tail end of COVID. Okay, yeah. so tail end 2020. Yeah. yeah. Now, what is, I think, simply amazing is that, you know, it's, it's when, when we hear through some of these, these um, what's the word when we hear some of the details about the progress the business has made and you begin to realize this has happened in pretty much five years uh, it's pretty astounding uh, between the end of 2020 and 2022 2023 of course the business expands rapidly mm. uh, i think the one thing i've admired about the value business is even now uh, in in spite of that success it's still a relatively lean team Mm. Uh, I think between 60 and 70, is that, that correct? It's just about 80 now. Just about 80 yeah. now, yeah. Uh, which is not the tendency of most crypto exchanges, right? Mm. They ramp up the employment quite quite heavily. Uh, but within the, the next two years post-COVID, um, you have got just this explosion in the number of retail accounts, institutional accounts, um, to the point that in 2022, um, you announce a $50 million Series B uh, which is significant, not only one of the biggest Series Bs of a crypto startup, um, but specifically any startup in the African mm -hmm. context. Uh, and whilst 
startup valuations are pretty much misleading because until the business sells, it's not worth that. So that was at about a $240 million valuation. Um, that is four years after you've started this business. Um, mm -hmm. What does it feel like? What does it feel like to raise that amount of money? Uh, and, you know, I think you'll be the first to tell me that we hadn't arrived at anything, really. <laughs> this is just another step on the journey. Mm -hmm. But just <clears throat> the four founders, did you ever get, get around and go, wow? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think it was definitely a big achievement uh, for us to uh, hit that kind of valuation mm. and that kind of raise. Um, for me, when I look ahead, the, it's like a mountain to climb. Uh, and when I look back, there's quite a bit that we've all sure. also achieved. So um, this money that we raised is, is an enabler for us. You know, I think we, we owe it to our investors and our customers mm -hmm. and to the team that we've built that we use this money wisely to expand our business, expand our offerings, and uh, achieve, uh, climb this mountain and sure. <laughs> reach the top, you know. Um, <clears throat> and that <clears throat> that is the aspiration we set out with, you know. So we, we, we raised this money with the intention to build um, crypto-native products and serve a global audience. And that is the, that's mm -hmm. the mission statement. Mm -hmm. So... So we set out on that journey, and then uh, uh, yes, of course, it's uh, it feels great, but it's still, you know, we have a responsibility. Mm. It's, uh, we haven't arrived if we just raise. It's a pressure we, that comes it means with it. it means if we raise, then the work just starts. Sure. Right. So, so we started um, on this journey to build uh, more crypto products mm. and and. Uh, see how we can expand globally. So we started uh, pursuing licenses. We started pursuing India. We started pursuing the Middle East, uh, uh, pursuing the uh, rest of Africa and things like that. So, so we, tr we did that. We raised the, uh, um, the number of team members from 40 to 80. And I must say, the team that we've built is just incredible. Mm -hmm. And from the, like, the way I feel about my co-founding team, is is very similar to the way I feel about all the people mm. who we have hired. We we are very selective, and uh, we we want to keep that culture of service mm. and doing your best and serving serving the people with the products that mm. we build. Mm. And I see that with every single person that we've Amazing. hired. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, mm. I don't know if that answers your question. It does. It <laughs> certainly does. Um, I think that mandate with which you're building the business has continued to resonate. Uh, late 2023, you break half a million retail accounts, $10 billion in transaction flows uh, through the platform since inception. Uh, you launch a partnership with Visa, of course, which is a massive payments enabler. I even read that Vela is enabling Bitcoin payments at pick and pay. Mm. Um, and so certainly not resting on what you've always done and assuming it will always work uh, these are incredibly innovative mm. uh, things and i'm sure the 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 path ahead is looking very very exciting um you've announced the intent to expand internationally as well and i think before we talk about expansion and just what's next mm. obviously the crypto market at large globally has had an interesting couple of years not just in terms of volatility of the crypto price but some famed institutions having some interesting downfalls, uh, both on the founder front and maybe institutionally. And I think what I, I took from even the, the, the earlier part of this, um, this uh, interview is you were building a security business first and then a crypto right. exchange. And I think, again, that speaks to the values and the alignment and very clear about this is much bigger than just, uh, just trading mm -hmm. crypto for yourself and the founding team. Um, Talk to us about the, how you manage uh, where, when the narrative perhaps or the or brand crypto gets damaged at a, at a macro level. Mm. How, does, how do you respond? How does Valor respond? Um, yeah, maybe there's some lessons there for, for the audience as well. Mm. Yeah, I think there are <coughs> uh, headwinds uh, that the crypto industry has faced, both uh, regulatory mm. and uh, otherwise. And uh, like you mentioned, uh, big crypto companies um, behaving um, not uh, not very trustworthy. 
So I think that then goes back to the values that we hold dear. You know, at the core of everything that we do is service. The core of everything that we do is um, highly ethical and values-driven business. And uh, and that is um, what is required in the crypto space as well. You know, I think trust is a, a rare commodity um, in 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 the world in general. And uh, what we've seen uh, in crypto particularly. So I think that is where we 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 want to thrive. Mm-hmm. You know, that is where we want to um, be unique, that we are not out to uh, fleece the customers. Mm-hmm. We are here to serve the customers. And we we believe in the 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 f- force that is crypto that can bring about good in 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 the world. Mm-hmm. And we want to make that accessible in a responsible way. And uh, and I think we have established ourselves uh, as a trustworthy brand in South Africa, sure. and and that is the challenge. Take mm-hmm. that trustworthy uh, brand name globally, where there are, it's very overcrowded. But despite all that, uh, f- f- based on the latest statistics, um, we are a top fifty crypto exchange in the world, uh, uh, according to Coin Gecko, sitting at forty five. And our goal is to be uh, one of the top 10 in, in the coming years. Mm. And that means that building on uh, the image of trust that we have uh, globally, building on um, uh, compliant procedures to, to align with the regulatory requirements mm. uh, everywhere. It also means that we want to build the products that, are, that, pe- that people want to use. You know, I think... Uh, in the traditional financial system, there are many, many products that a common man does not have access to. But in the crypto space, it is possible. Mm. But of course, with uh, with some regulations, may not be possible. Uh, but when it comes to derivatives or margin trading that we have recently built and launched, uh, it is it is clear that seventy five percent of the volumes are, uh, in in the crypto space comes from those kinds of products. Wow. So building those kinds of products and building on the trust and uh, and still complying with uh, all the regulatory requirements is 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 a delicate balance, mm. and um, and we are here to uh, here here to go on this journey and see where it leads. Amazing. Yeah, it's amazing, and uh, just taking from this quick time together, I think I'd I'd bank on. I bank on you and I bank on the team, right? Um, two quick questions that I like to ask uh, any guest of ours on the show before we, we conclude in the next few minutes. And it's more just personally for you. You've gone on this incredible journey across countries, maybe a journey of discovery. I think like all of us are on as we navigate our careers, especially as we found things of, of our own that are both aligned with competency and passion. Many founders listening to the podcast today are either already in founding space, some post product, some are fortunate to have raised capital, you naturally are going to be approached by many founders. I've got no doubt that your LinkedIn gets flooded with, I need a mentor, I need this, and we'll park whether that's the right way to go about doing that or not. But whilst I've got you here, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you, maybe just for a piece of advice uh, for, for founders who might listen in on this, uh, and maybe some common things that you see that founders are perhaps doing wrong or maybe something from your journey that is mm. just a key lesson that you, you is a non-negotiable for you. So just a, a piece of advice or a non-negotiable anecdote we could share with our audience here today mm-hmm. that might uh, equip our founders uh, to be better and more effective. I think the first thing I would say, it's, uh, it's much easier to go on this journey um, not alone. Mm. And, uh, and there is, there's a trick to that as well because you cannot go on this journey with any, anyone uh, you really need someone uh, very smart um, highly skilled but at the same time at the foundation highly values driven because um, you don't want to partner with uh, with a smart crook right so I think uh, the we want to go on this journey and have a similar vision of what we want to really achieve, 
uh, go on this journey uh, because you know on this journey there will be many disagreements mm. you know many conflicts but if you if the foundation is strong and the, we are still united then uh, then you can achieve great things and that is also something i cherish uh, at vala and it's been i think it's 6 years uh, in march this year being together working together having our, have had our conflicts um and difference in approaches to solving problems mm-hmm. and figuring out okay maybe we should do this and not that and but at the core of it all again it comes comes from uh the bahai concept of consultation that you want to consult on all matters and uh, you want to give everybody an equal voice and once you say something it's not yours you know you don't hold on to your ideas and you bring to bring together those ideas and those ideas can morph into something new or mm. something great mm. and then you go with that and i can see in the last 6 years of this journey through process of consultation we have made many many decisions that have served us really really well because if we had gone the other way and things would be really really bad mm. and looking back i think there's some divine assistance uh, in this approach of consultation uh that we have been even like the time to raise our series b mm. or who to partner with or who who should we get the liquidity from or what product to build and so many things i can look back and say okay if we had made the wrong decision mm. Mm. things would be very different sure so i think having that culture of inclusivity and uh, having those values and mm. going on this journey with people who are like minded like minded doesn't mean they have to have the same opinion mm. it's actually better if they have different opinions but you are aligned on the vision and uh you're working towards towards that vision i think that is the like the single most ingredient for success amazing yeah but i mean brilliant and worth worth gold i think some of that learned wisdom buddy we're going to let you go in a couple of seconds but the one question i love to ask folks and i have asked you this in the past but just for the benefit of the audience is it's been a you know it, it might be tempting to think you've reached success i don't think that certainly you believe that um but 50 years from now when you're sitting on uh, a patio perhaps <laughs> and in your rocking chair and you look back on your life what what does success look like mm. for buddy uh what is mm. uh, what what does that mean is it is it all the wealth in the world it certainly doesn't seem that way but you know is it generational wealth is it legacy what 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 does success look like for you mm. good question 50 years from now <laughs> i'll be in my 90s yes <laughs> <laughs> i don't know if uh, i'll be alive maybe 40 <laughs> yes um you know i think uh for me yes we have built a uh, successful business still a long way to go as i said mm-hmm. a mountain to climb um but at the core of it um all of us believe that family comes first and uh i have two beautiful boys and raising them in the right way uh, so that they can also be of service to humanity um and having this success in business enabling me to do that uh and providing them with all the all the opportunities um to to be the best versions of themselves and i think that to me would be success amazing i don't know that it could be put much better but um buddy thank you what an absolute privilege it's been to sit uh, and just dive into your journey and the journey of vela i have got absolutely no doubt that we're going to see more significant things coming from both yourself and the business in the short to medium term ladies and gentlemen uh, buddy sudhakaran co-founder and chief product officer at vala thank you so much matt thanks for listening to today's episode that was buddy sudhakaran co-founder of vala i'm matthew marsden and if you enjoyed today's show please be sure to subscribe to our channel follow us on our socials and share with your network We'll see you next time.